All right. Good morning, everyone. People are slowly filtering in. Um, it's not quite 1030, so we'll give ourselves a minute here for everyone to join us. But thank you for attending uh, Native Plants for Florida Yards today. We're going to be focusing on, on plants that are more um, you know, generally used for um, most you know, different site conditions. We're not gonna use any plants really today that are really specialized plants um, that need really specialized conditions. Um, so this will make it easier for people to put the right plant in the right place. Um, which is very important. Someone just asked if we could add native ferns um, in our presentation. We do have one native fern in our presentation today. Um, you'll be glad to know. <laughs> um, good. Okay, it is 1030. So I'm going to go ahead and start my screen share here and get us going. All right. Here we go. Okay. And it's moving. That's always a good thing. <laughs> All right. Um, as I said, welcome today. Um, if you're just joining us, thank you for attending Native Plants for Florida Yards. Um, I'm Susan Griffith, and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here at UF IFAS Manatee County Extension. Um, some of you may be joining from other areas. Um, occasionally, we'll get people that are even joining from out of the country. So thank you for joining. Um, but just keep in mind that um, the plants that we're specifying here are for our area here um, in Manti County. We are either zone 9B or zone 10A for people that are along the coast or um, southern parts of the county near the coast. Okay, um, just a brief, uh, to, briefly to familiarize you with Florida Friendly Landscaping. The goal of the program is to encourage you to plant Florida Friendly or native vegetation. Um, it doesn't have to be all native. Um, of course, today we're talking about native plants, but there are plenty of Florida Friendly plants as well um, that are perfectly fine to use. Um, but the goal of our program today, of course, is to encourage you to add some uh, native plants to your landscape um, in case you don't have any. Um, so um, to add that, that Florida friendly or native vegetation um, that requires little or no water after it's established and little or no fertilizer. That's one of the great benefits of native plants. They do require very little fertilizer. Um, and the benefits to you, it could reduce your water bill and you'll be providing a healthier environment with fewer toxins and supporting native wildlife by providing the food that they need. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. Number one, right plant, right place. Very, very important. And as I mentioned, you know, it is possible to put a native plant even in the wrong place. Um, some native plants uh, need a lot of water. Um, they might be wetlands species. So um, in their native habitat, they require really wet soil, which you may not have in your yard. Um, so that plant would not be the right plant for you. Um, so it's really important to do research on plants before you purchase them and make sure that you're not putting a plant that needs shade um, into full sun. Um, there's a lot of different variables with the needs of plants. So right plant, right place is very, very important. Watering efficiently is number two. Fertilizing appropriately is number three. Mulch is number four, also very important. Um, using the correct type of mulch is also very important as well. Um, using a sustainable mulch 
Um, you don't want to be using um, cypress mulch, for instance, because cypress mulch is made from the very beneficial native cypress trees. So um, we don't recommend using cypress mulch. Um, you can use floor mulch. You can use pine bark or pine straw. Those are sustainable mulches. Number five is attracting wildlife. Very important. Um, we have a lot of people moving to Florida. So um, wildlife is, is losing some of its habitat at a pretty rapid rate. So uh, supplying the plants that the wildlife needs that they're very dependent upon um, in the form of native plants is very important. Managing your yard pest responsibly. Um, not just blanket spraying your entire yard um, and tolerating some pests. Um, some pests turn out to be butterflies. <laughs> you don't want to be spraying caterpillars that are future butterflies. Uh, number seven is recycling in your landscape. Um, you can do that in the form of composting um, or building brush piles. Uh, number eight, reducing stormwater runoff. And number nine is protecting the waterfront. So I mentioned uh, Florida's population increasing and it definitely is. It's projected to reach about 36 million people by 2060 and about 7 million acres of rural, rural and natural lands could be converted to urban use at that point. And that difference is an area equivalent to the size of the state of Vermont. So it's, it's quite a large area of land. Some of the benefits of native vegetation, um, they'll provide, of course, as I mentioned, food um, for native wildlife species, as well as cover, very important as well. And once established, um, native plants typically require less care and fewer resources to maintain than non-native plants do, and they generally do not need to be fertilized. Native plants have adapted to Florida's conditions and have evolved with native animals. They tend to have better resistance to pests and diseases requiring fewer pesticides. And of course, keep in mind that many of them are um, the larval host um, plant for certain species of butterflies and moths. So um, you don't want to be spraying those caterpillars because they are eating the food that they're supposed to be eating. Um, so <laughs> you don't want to kill them. Remember right plant, right place, and always do research before purchasing any plant. Even natives can be planted in the wrong place, as I said. Uh, and do keep in mind that native plants still do need to be watered in for the establishment period, just like any other plant. Um, but then they should be able to exist without irrigation once established. And if you do have an HOA, remember that you always have to get approval from your HOA's um, architectural review board or committee prior to making any changes in your landscape. Uh, turf in the landscape. Uh, turf has its purpose in the landscape for filtration. It's really excellent filtering. Um, it's good for erosion control. You may need it for play areas for children and pets, but turf does provide very little in the way of food or cover for wildlife. Um, that's pretty clear. And also there's a lot of spraying of pesticides that goes along with turf ownership. And that can be very detrimental to the health of birds and other wildlife um, and the insects that the birds need to eat in order to survive. So consider um, reducing your mowing frequency and low visibility areas of your yard, if at all possible, and use alternative ground covers where turf will not grow or is very difficult to maintain, such as slopes, under trees, that sort of thing. Um, that's all part of right plant, right place. Um, and try to create some corridors or islands of vegetation to provide food and cover for wildlife. Um, and also to reduce the amount of heavily, heavily maintained turf grass on your property. So here is an example of a typical conventional yard. 
um, you know, with a, a huge expanse of turf grass. Um, and in this picture, queen palms that are caution may become invasive. Queen palms are very, very common, but they're not native. Um, all of this is non-native. And a yard like this really requires four times the water, four times the energy, four times the chemicals in the form of fertilizers and pesticides to maintain a, with about a 10,000 square foot of lawn or more than a yard like this or a yard like this or this or this one or this one. You're starting to get the idea. <laughs> So some of the challenges, um, most Americans are uncomfortable with landscapes they perceive to be wild or unmaintained, but are attracted to landscapes within an obviously managed context. Um, this is why you may get some pushback occasionally from HOAs um, because people are very comfortable when they have boundaries of well-maintained turf grass around a naturally landscaped area. It really does a lot to increase people's comfort level with native plantings. And that was from research done um, by Dr. Joan Nassauer, um, who's a fellow with the American um, Society of Landscape Architects. Another um, issue <laughs> is that people often really do not know um, that plants are not native. Um, you know, we have a lot of people moving to Florida and they kind of tend to assume that if they see a plant repeated over and over again in everybody's landscape and their community, they tend to think it's a native plant. Um, and also Googled beautiful Florida native landscape plants. And this is one of the first photos that came up. So none of these plants are native in this photo. Um, so these days it's actually far more rare to see a native plant in a home landscape. And so I'm not saying that any of these plants are necessarily a bad thing. Um, as long as they're Florida friendly and not invasive, it's okay to use non-native plants. But it's also very important to add native plants to your, to your home landscape. We do tend to use the same six or seven plants, non-native plants over and over again. And these are considered non-native ornamental plants. Um, again, they're fine to use as long as they're not invasive. Um, now lawns are kind of the poster child for the monoculture, <laughs> uh, which is monocultures are using a lot of the same plant. Um, using a lot of the same plant in a monoculture situation um, can lead to um, increases in, in pest pressure and things like that. So um, monoculture like lawns definitely are susceptible to harboring fleas and ticks, mole crickets, sod webworms, chinch bugs, many other pests. Um, they're also susceptible to many diseases. Um, lawns are very dependent for this reason on regular fertilizer and pesticide treatments to keep it looking healthy. The potential for overwatering is also very high um, with everyone's desire to keep it looking perfect. Um, it's very wildlife unfriendly. It provides no shelter, no food, and it is a not native. Here are some statistics about sod. Um, annually in the US alone, $29 billion a year is spent on lawn care products. $29 billion. Of that, $5 billion is on fossil fuel derived fertilizers. $700 million is uh, spent on lawn pesticides. 600 million gallons of gas goes to lawn mowers. Uh, 26 million households pay for lawn services. And 80,000 lawn mower related accidents send the operator to the ER each year. And water and pollution. Um, 30 to 60 percent of all household water is used to irrigate traditional landscapes. 
just watering a 20 by 50 foot patch of grass is equivalent to a human's personal water needs for one week. One single lawnmower running for one hour creates as much air pollution as four conventional cars. And string trimmers and gas powered items are even worse. And also <laughs> to top it all off, um, an estimated 17 million gallons of fossil fuel is spilled just while filling up lawn equipment in the US each year, according to the EPA. So that's pretty staggering alone. So the importance of native plants, um, the, the benefits to wildlife cannot be overstated. Um, Florida native plants have co-evolved with our native animal species for millions of years. In some cases, these plants are the only food source for a certain species of animal, and without it, extinction can happen. Um, and life is very interconnected in nature in ways that we really cannot see and do not understand. And often several species are affected adversely by the loss of just one plant in an ecosystem. Okay, we're gonna pause for a quick question. Um, and you can just type your answer into the chat, please. Do you have to use all native plants in order to have what is considered a Florida landscape as long as the plants you're using are not invasive? please type yes or no into the chat to answer that question. And we'll give everybody a minute to do that. You may have joined us late and didn't hear me talking about that, um, but we'll give just a minute here, a few more seconds. Okay, the answer is no, <laughs> you do not have to use all native plants in order to have what is considered a Florida friendly landscape. It would be great if you can have an element of native plants in your yard. If you wanna go all native, that's wonderful, um, but there's really no reason to rip out all of your landscape and put in all native plants, um, unless you wanna be a, a true purist about it, <laughs> uh, which is fine if you'd like to do that, but um, you don't need to do that to be considered a Florida friendly landscape, as long as the plants you're using are not invasive. Okay, that is a common misconception. So I wanted to clear that up. Okay, I wanna show you now the Florida Native Plant Society website because this is an excellent resource. If you're not familiar with it, um, you should definitely visit this site. Um, this allows you to do that really important research that I talked about doing before you buy your plants to make sure that you're putting the right plant in the right place. Um, they have a brand new website as of this year. So um, I'll take you through um, a few important aspects of it just to familiarize you a little bit with it in case you haven't seen the new version of it. So um, you can click up here to native plants um, and this drop down will bring you um, one of these options is native plants for your area. So if you click on that, um, you can, you'll see the state of Florida pop up here and then you select your county from the drop down. And once you do that, then you come down here and you select your USDA zone. And I did mention in Manti County, we are either 10A if you live along the South Coast or well, anywhere along the coast um, in, in Manti County is 10A. Um, and then the rest of the county is going to be 9B. So you, you select whichever one is appropriate for you from that drop down there. And that's what that looks like. You can select both if you're kind of on the cusp. A lot of people are um, kind of in an in-between area or they have um, certain conditions that contribute to a, a microclimate that allows them to have 10B plant or 10A plants if they live in 10A or if they live in 9B rather. Okay, um, so here's uh, the NOAA data and the USDA plant hardiness map. Our county is right here. 
and the, the more pale orange area indicates the 10B areas and the, the yellowy zone is the 9B part. Okay, so after that, you can um, pick your light options for full sun part shade or full shade and um, select noted for will bring you a menu of whether it has flowers that you're looking for showy flowers or if you're looking for salt tolerance, that sort of thing. Um, down here, you can pick which types of wildlife you would like your plants to be suitable for and whether it serves all of these choices or at least one of your choices. Just know that the more items that you click to specify things, um, you're going to get a much more narrow list of plants. <laughs> If you keep it more general, you'll have a, a much broader list of plants to choose from. You can play with it, um, go back and, and alter alter it and then redo it um, all day long. <laughs> um, down here, you can move these dots around for your moisture range options. Um, over here on the far left with the blue is aquatic conditions and you just move that over. Um, most people are somewhere in the middle between um, really wet and really dry, um, but you just move these dots to, to give you what your um, site conditions um, reflect. And it's quite easy. Um, and you might want to think about joining the Native Plant Society if you haven't already. Um, one of the benefits of it is that you will receive 10% off of your purchases from your local native plant nurseries. So that can be a, a great benefit. Um, it costs about $30 a year to join the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, so that can definitely pay off if you're planning on buying a lot of native plants. And speaking of buying native plants, you can go to the Florida Association of Native Nurseries site here, afnn.org, to find uh, growers of local plants around the state. And another great resource is the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative, which sells the seeds to native wildflowers. And that can be, especially if you're talking about a, a large butterfly garden area or something like that, that you're trying to put in, um, this can be really more cost effective for sure um, to buy the seeds rather than to buy the plants. Okay, now we're going to start by talking about the plants that are most appropriate for um, the zone of 10A, so the more coastal areas. Um, this also applies to uh, like Sarasota, um, Charlotte County, that sort of thing as well, if you're, if you're watching from a different county. Um, okay, and down a little further as well. <laughs> Basically, we're the cutoff point um, for 10A and it goes down south from there. Okay, so sea grape, a lot of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's kind of a ubiquitous coastal plant um, because it's very, very highly salt tolerant. And when I say that something is very or highly salt tolerant today, we are talking about the ability for this plant to tolerate actual salt water inundation in the roots. If I'm saying that it's only moderately salt tolerant, that means that it cannot handle saltwater inundation, but that it can handle some degree of salt spray, um, or it can handle perhaps brackish water, occasional brackish water inundation, um, such as you would find with like a tropical storm flooding condition that is a temporary condition. Um, but if it says very salt tolerant, that means that it can handle um, really high salts all, pretty much all the time. Okay, so this is one of those plants. And it's a great pollinator and wild, wildlife food plant. It does produce this really tasty fruit, which humans can eat as well. I'm a big fan. Um, it can be kept pruned as a shrub or allowed to grow into a very large tree. The sand live oak 
tends to be a um, slightly more salt tolerant. It's just a moderately salt tolerant tree, um, but more so than the live oak. And it is smaller stature than the live oak, but still quite stately. It gets up to about 40 feet high and 30 feet wide. It likes really sandy soils. Um, it can withstand hurricane winds. So another good reason for this to be more of a coastal plant. And it is really excellent for supporting native wildlife like, like most oaks are. It's the larval host for several butterfly species and their acorns are actually preferred by many bird species because they're lower in tannins. The gumbo limbo. <laughs> this one is known for its very interesting branching and its red peeling bark. They call it the Taurus tree. It is the larval host for the dingy purple wing butterfly and birds and other wildlife will consume its seeds. It is partially deciduous and only moderately salt tolerant. Uh, the West Indian mahogany is another large tree. This guy gets up to about 70 feet tall by 60 feet wide. It has very showy fruits, um, very pleasant fragrance and really excellent hurricane wind resistance. The sable palm is our Florida state tree, even though it's not really a tree. <laughs> um, it is an excellent wildlife plant. It is said to support um, at least 50 different species of wildlife. Um, this is its mature version over here, of course, with the tall trunk, um, but this is what it looks like as a youngster with its very short trunk, which leads to um, confusion and misidentification in some cases because it looks so different when it's young. And it is the larval host plant for the monk skipper the silver buttonwood, uh, Conocarpus erectus. This is extremely high salt tolerance with this one. Um, these guys coexist with um, mangroves in the wild quite frequently. Um, attractive, um, especially in the silver form, is really very attractive and it does have mass market availability. Um, you can actually find this in the big box stores as well as native plant nurseries. It is a nectar source and little host plant for the Marshall scrub hair streak and the Tantalus sphinx moth. The false mastic tree, uh, cider rocks along fitted to dis. That's one of those really long uh, Latin names that have mangled quite well. Um, moderate cell tolerance on this one. Uh, it's a large tree that can get up to 60 feet uh, or above 60 feet rather. It can reach eventually a hundred feet tall. Very large tree, great for shade. Um, it has interesting foliage and flowers that support insects and it is tolerant of brackish water um, inundation as is this one, it's relative, also a Cideroxalon. Um, this one also moderately salt tolerant, um, but will tolerate um, brackish inundation, um, but not sustain salt spray on the foliage. This is a medium tree, uh, slow growing up to about 25 feet. It does produce fruit for birds and mammals and has flowers for insects and a very pleasant fragrance when it's blooming. The fiddlewood also has very pleasant fragrance when it's blooming. And this is a really pretty um, either large shrub or it can be trained to uh, really a beautiful little a small tree up to about 25 feet tall. Um, the flowers do attract a wide variety of pollinators and it is the larval host plant for the Epicorsia moth. Uh, berries are eaten by uh, many species of wildlife. It's just a nice little tree. Um, it's very friendly to add to pretty much any landscape. Okay, cocoa plum. This is moderately salt tolerant. Um, it can function as a large shrub or a hedge or a small tree um, if it's pruned that way. There are different ecotypes as well as cultivars. And it does have edible fruit, which is a big plus. Edible for humans as well. It's not bad, um, which comes on in the late spring or summer. The pitch apple, 
Um, this does not really have edible fruit for humans, despite the name. Maybe it's called that because people took a bite and they pitched, they pitched the apple. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so you don't want to really eat the fruit on this one, but um, it does have very pretty flowers and it does have really high aerosol salt tolerance. It can be an excellent screener. It can be maintained as a hedge or it can also be a small specimen tree. These are readily available. These are sold in pretty much all the stores now. Okay, Jamaica caper. This one has moderate salt tolerance. It can be a shrub or a small tree to about 12 feet tall. It looks better when kept in the shade as it is an understory plant in the wild. So in, in its native habitat, it is accustomed to growing under the shade of, of larger trees. In, in full sun, it gets a little pale. Okay, the sweet acacia. This one is highly, highly salt tolerant. Um, it can take salt water inundation. It can take um, salt water um, spray on the leaves, really highly salt tolerant. Um, thorny branches make it a really good cover for birds and other wildlife, but because of the thorny branches, you want to be careful where you use it, um, not in high traffic areas like by a sidewalk where it can snag people. Um, it attracts pollinators. It has really highly scented flowers, um, which really, oh, they're lovely. Um, it makes a very nice small tree up to about 20 feet tall and 10 feet wide, and it blooms for most of the year. The Sol Palmetto, Saranoa repens. This is a moderately salt tolerant one. The silver one is particularly beautiful. Um, it's mainly associated with the Florida East Coast, um, but it can occur anywhere within the range. And of course the silver is sold at our local native plant nurseries. It can get very large. It can be deceptive because you'll probably buy one as a very tiny little, little fellow um, and it grows very slowly. However, it can get up to 15 feet tall by 10 feet wide. So, and be sure, you know, you don't want to space it really close to your home. You don't want to space it really close to sidewalks or in any kind of little narrow area. You want to give the sky a lot of space to grow into its eventual full size. Okay, sea lavender. This is a lovely little shrub that it gets to about six feet tall and about 10 feet wide. It is endangered in the wild. Um, a lot of native plants actually are. Um, I'm bringing it up for this one, um, but a lot of native plants have been poached basically um, because of their beauty um, in the wild. So um, that is a definite no-no. Um, you don't wanna be poaching, um, but you can find these at your local native plant nursery. Um, it's really best for properties that are near saltwater. It can be susceptible to diseases if it's planted in inland locations. Um, you will have butterflies visiting its pretty flowers when they bloom. Okay, Florida tetrazygia or Myconia bicolor. Um, this one actually has low to no salt tolerance. Um, this is a large shrub from 10 to 30 feet. It can be used as a specimen plant, a uh, hedge for screening. It has very interesting foliage and it also has really pretty flowers, um, giving it the common name West Indian lilac. Bay cedar is another one that is extremely high in the salt tolerance. It is a large shrub up to about 10 feet high. It can be used as a hedge or specimen plant. It is the host plant for the Marshall scrub hair streak and the mallow scrub hair streak. Um, it's also a nectar plant for these and many other butterflies. It has excellent hurricane resistance. The white stopper, oh, excuse me. Um, this one is a shrub 10 to 20 feet and it is another understory. So it's to have a little bit of shade under larger trees. It makes a great hedge or screening plant. The flowers are very showy um, and the fruit um, will attract birds. And it is the larval host of the Tantalus sphinx. And it, it has been said by some to have a rather skunky fragrance and it definitely does. It's, it's a 
kind of an odd smell, um, but it's it's interesting and it's kind of earthy. <laughs> All right, the coral bean, Erythrina herbacea. Um, this one is salt tolerant to spray, but not to inundation. Um, this one is full sun or part shade. It's a large shrub that grows five to 15 feet tall. Um, you can keep it smaller with pruning um, and with an up to 20 foot spread. It has these beautiful red, um, quite profuse tubular flowers that do attract hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, and it does have really interesting foliage when it's not in bloom. It is completely deciduous, so it will lose all of its leaves uh, during the winter, but in the spring you get the flowers first and then the foliage comes back. Um, it is tolerant of wet and dry soils both, and it can take cold temperatures um, all the way to zone eight. The necklace pod, uh, Sephora tomentosa, um, uh, variety truncata. Uh, this one is highly salt tolerant and it is a large shrub with really, really interesting foliage. It's kind of silvery green. It has these large yellow tubular flowers that attract hummingbirds and butterflies. It gets up to about 10 feet tall with about a 12 foot spread and it is really fairly drought tolerant once it's established. It also does well in inland locations where other can be protected from hard freezes. The maidenberry, uh, Crossopetalum racoma. This one is highly salt tolerant. It's a large shrub, really good for coastal areas. It can take inundation of, of salt water and salt spray. It gets up to be about eight feet high, eight feet wide, and it can be used in a group as a screening hedge or in, as a solitary specimen plant if you'd like to train it as a small tree. Um, it has really showy red fruit that's very attractive to birds. Adam's needle, yucca filamentosa, is moderately salt tolerant, a very attractive plant. Um, it can handle sun or shade and has excellent drought tolerance. Here is Pineland Lantana, Lantana depressa. It has moderate salt tolerance. Um, I wanna mention that you want to be aware of non-native Lantanas from big box stores. They are probably invasive. Um, so we really would recommend that you get your Lantana from native plant nurseries, just so you know what you're getting. Um, this beautiful lantana gets up to be about four feet tall with about a six foot spread. And it is just a magnet for pollinators. It is constantly covered with all sorts of a variety of different pollinators. The butterflies adore it. Um, this is actually in my backyard shown here and it's always covered. It's, it's a real focal point and a source of fascination in my backyard that keeps me very well entertained. Um, it does not like irrigation, however. I do not have irrigation in my yard and it's very happy in a really sunny spot with no irrigation. It, it blooms continuously in full sun um, pretty much all year long. So really lovely plant. Uh, the Kunti, another lovely plant that I'm a big fan of, um, very tolerant of most conditions, including salt. It can live in sun or shade conditions. And one of the great things about it, it needs zero hedging or shaping. Um, it just has that wonderful rounded form all of its own. Um, and it is a zamia. It's very palm-like, but it's a zamia, not a palm and it grows very slowly, very, very slowly. Um, so the plant that you'll purchase is gonna be rather small. Um, just allow plenty of space because it will grow very slowly to four feet high and four feet wide. So allow enough space so it's not crowded. All right, muley grass, um, Muhlenbergia capillaris, highly salt tolerant. Um, most of the year, it looks like a typical uh, grass, ornamental grass, but then in the fall, it puts on this beautiful show um, with these purplish plumes that are really magnificent. Um, very tolerant of all conditions, 
drought, occasional flooding um, is fine. Dwarf Thakahatchee grass is another kind of well-behaved native uh, ornamental grass. Um, this one is the dwarf, so it's, it's more practical for home landscapes than the full-size Thakahatchee grass, which is much larger. Um, this is the larval host plant for the Byssus skipper. Um, and even when trimmed occasionally, it will return to a tent-like bunch, which is really excellent cover for small mammals, birds, and reptiles. And deer will eat the hard corn-like seed um, produced by this grass. You can kind of see it in this picture. It's just forming now. It can die back um, during exceptionally cold snaps in certain areas, but it will quickly regrow. The tropical sage is another beautiful native um, hummingbird and butterfly attractor. Um, also nuthatches, warblers, and bumblebees enjoy this plant. It can take full sun or part shade. Um, it can get up to five feet tall by two feet wide. Um, I was amazed the first time I saw one that was almost as tall as me, <laughs> but it, it does happen. Um, it can reseed itself and it may become aggressive in some people's opinions. Okay, coastal sea rocket. This is highly salt tolerant. Uh, it's a coastal perennial that makes a really good ground cover um, for coastal areas. It will reseed itself. It does not like irrigation or acidic soils. So if you have really, really sandy soil and no irrigation, this could be the plant for you. Mangrove spider lily. Um, this one is extremely salt tolerant. Um, this can get two to three feet tall and can fill in large areas. Oops, I have an extra A in area. <laughs> um, in a couple of years, if the conditions are optimal, um, they're a very long lived perennial and they do reproduce uh, on a pretty, what could be called aggressive basis in some yards. Beach creeper is a really nice little ground cover um, for high, hot, sunny, dry areas that are difficult for a lot of plants. Um, this is another great plant for those conditions. It can actually die if regularly ir irrigated, um, just like the, the sea rocket. All right, Elliot's love grass. This, if you're looking for a small grass, um, a petite little grass, this is your guy. Um, they're moderately salt tolerant. It gets up to only about two feet tall. And when it blooms, it, it just kind of looks like a mist surrounding the grass. It's really very attractive. Um, there's also a purple love grass that's quite pretty as well. Um, this is great for either mass plantings or edging a bed around taller native plants. Um, small birds and other wildlife will definitely visit it to consume the seeds that it produces. Um, it is the larval host plant for the Zabulon skipper. Um, it will not tolerate saltwater inundation, um, but it can take uh, a bit of salt spray. Um, it's considered a short-lived perennial, but it will most likely reseed itself. The West Coast Dune Sunflower. Um, this is pictured here, Helianthus debilis, um, subspecies Vestitis. And this is the West Coast um, subspecies, which is a lower growing subspecies than the East Coast variety, which gets a good bit taller. Um, so this really makes an excellent ground cover. Um, for any full sun areas throughout the county. Um, it's, it's quite tolerant of conditions. Um, it is considered an annual though. Um, a lot of people assume that it's a perennial, but it's actually considered an annual or a very short lived perennial. So um, this is one that you, you may end up having to replace it eventually, um, but that's fine. It's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful plant. Um, it may reseed itself though. Um, all right, spiderwort. Speaking of reseeding itself, this one is very good about doing that as well. Um, it could be called an enthusiastic reseeder, this one. Um, but that's great because it's a beautiful plant with beautiful flowers. It can be used as um, sort of an open airy ground cover. 
um, or really it's ideal as a border plant um, because of its growth habit. Um, it's very pollinator friendly, especially bees love it. Um, just warning, it is extremely delicate. So when you're transporting it after you buy it, just be very careful so you don't snap off all of its limbs. Um, the native porterweed, this is the prostrate porterweed. Um, some of you may be familiar with the non-native porterweeds that are quite tall. They can get, you know, six feet tall. Um, this one, not at all. The native one is a great ground cover. It's um, a great spreading ground cover for sunny, dry spots. Um, it it does need an establishment period where it's watered regularly to establish, but once it's established, um, it really does appreciate a, a sunny, dry spot. Um, it is the host plant for the tropical buckeye butterfly. Um, it will probably reseed itself. I can pretty much guarantee you <laughs> that it will reseed itself. Um, so you get free plants again. Um, and it, it definitely, the flowers really attract pollinators like crazy. Um, especially butterflies, um, lovely ground cover plant. Here is a beautiful vine um, that is actually native to Key West, but as long as you keep it protected, um, you can have it even in 9B. I'm in 9B. I, ha I have a lot of these plants. Um, I have a microclimate though because I live really close to a, a huge body of water. And that really is what makes the difference in the zones is if you live near a huge body of water, it definitely does keep your temperatures up a bit. So um, that's again, the microclimate. Um, so as long as it's protected or you have a microclimate situation like that, um, you, can, you can have some of these plants that are not necessarily for zone 9B. Um, this is a really pretty vine. It can grow up to 12 feet if it has trellis or other support. Um, it can grow in full sun or part shade. And even if it's in part shade, it just blooms um, like crazy anyway. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the sun bloom, which is good. Um, it gets its purple flowers. It's like a bluish purple. It's a very unusual shade that you don't often see in the landscape. So that makes it quite special. Um, all during winter, all during spring. Um, and during winter, you know, flowers can be scarce. So this is one of those great little pops of color in your landscape during the winter time. And it does attract a huge variety of, of pollinators. This is one of those plants uh, in my yard that is just always a buzz with all sorts of different creatures. It's wonderful. Okay, the thatch palm, Thrinox radiata. Um, this is a salt tolerant guy. He's a slow growing native palm and it's quite beautiful. It will eventually reach 20 feet tall at uh, only about six inches per year um, growth rate. It is native to South Florida. Uh, this is another one that has been poached excessively in the wild, unfortunately. Um, but you can purchase this at uh, native plant nurseries. I've even seen this at big box stores. Um, it is cold sensitive, so you will definitely need to physically protect it if you are zone pushing, like I mentioned, um, to try to get it into zone 9B. Um, I do throw a sheet over mine in the winter if we get down, you know, pretty low, below 38. Okay. Buccaneer palm, the Pseudophoenix sargentii. This is another beautiful native plant that is rarely seen. This is another one that has been poached in the wild. Um, so it is endangered in the wild, but you can um, get this at certain native plant nurseries. Um, 10 to 20 feet high um, with an eight to 10 foot spread. It can get up to about 40 feet, but very, very slowly. It is native to South Florida and again, cold sensitive. So protect it in the winter if you happen to be um, in 9B. Okay, speaking of 9B, <laughs> we're gonna talk about the plants um, that are specifically for 9B, um, which is the majority of the county, the, the big yellow section of the county there on this map. Um, so that is the most of us. Okay, live oak. Um, this is another one that 
provides food and shelter for about a hundred different species of wildlife. So um, live oaks are really like a, a keystone species. Um, it's wonderful to be able to maintain one if you have the space for one. Um, it, there's it, it's the most valuable wildlife plant that we have really um, but they are massive <laughs> when they're full grown as many of you probably know um, they can get 80 feet tall and about 100 or 120 even in some cases feet wide so it needs plenty of space um, but it, it is a, a wonderful plant to add uh, to your landscape if you have the space for one the slash pine. Um, a lot of people don't think about um, pines. They're, they, you know, we don't even notice them most of the time because their foliage is up really high, but um, they're, they're a beautiful landscape plant, really. Um, and you can purchase one at a local native plant nursery. Um, they, they do get quite tall, the slash pine, up to about 100 feet tall and 50 feet wide in maturity. Um, but of course, that 50 feet wide, once it's mature, is way up in the sky. Um, it's a very fast growing tree. Um, birds and squirrels will eat the seeds. And the other bonus is that large birds of prey will often visit the top branches. The sugarberry, another large tree, um, very showy tree, very interesting bark, um, as you can see in that picture. Um, the fruit is eaten by birds and small animals. Um, it's a wonderful pollinator plant. Um, it is a larval host for the hackberry emperor, the morning cloak um, butterflies, and it is the sole larval host plant for the American snout and also the larval host for the tawny emperor and question mark butterflies. So um, it is a great um, butterfly host plant. It is deciduous. Um, and quite large, again, 80 feet high, 50 feet wide spread. But if you have the space, it's a, it's a great wildlife tree. Um, here's a smaller tree. Um, this is the Simpson Stopper. Um, it has moderate salt tolerance. Most of the plants that we're talking about now are not gonna be the, your coastal plants. These are gonna be plants that might have moderate salt tolerance, but none of the plants I'm gonna talk about from here on out are gonna be a high salt tolerant plant. Um, these are more for the more inland areas of the county, the 9B areas. Um, this can be maintained as a large shrub, or it can be trained into a really attractive tree up to about 30 feet high and about 20 feet wide. Um, it has really beautiful bark. So it is, it is definitely advantageous to, to let it grow into a large tree and show off that beautiful kind of coppery colored bark. Um, it's an excellent wildlife plant. The birds will come for the berries. They love the berries and pollinators love the flowers. This is another plant that just swarms with pollinators. Um, actually, this time of year when it's blooming, um, you can kind of hear <laughs> if you have a Simpson stopper nearby and it's blooming, you'll hear the buzz. Um, it's a very tolerant plant and its leaves smell like allspice when crushed. So really a lovely scent lovely plant. All right, sparkleberry. This is a relative of blueberry. Um, this is one that I threw in here just because I, I love this plant, but it does require a more acidic soil. So this is not one for everybody. Um, this can be a large shrub or small tree. It can get up to 25 feet tall and 15 feet wide, and it does prefer an, a location understory to um, high pines. The pines actually um, help with the acidity of the soil because their needles um, provide, as they break down, they, they provide acidity to the soil. So um, if you happen to have an area of, of pines, older pines in your yard, this is a, a great tree to add under them. Um, in spring, it has really profuse white flowers. Um, and it is the larval host plant for the striped hair streak. Um, it attracts many, many pollinators when it's blooming and it's especially valuable to native bees and the fruit will be consumed by birds and other wildlife. And the, the flowers are really quite pretty. They look a lot like blueberry flowers. Okay, marlberry. This is another understory. So this is not one that you wanna put in full sun. Um, this is a lovely small tree or you can maintain it as a shrub um, for shadier sites. 
Uh, it has really showy flowers and fruit, as you can see in that picture. And interesting foliage, interesting bark. It has very weak wood, however, and very minimal salt tolerance, um, but it is a great wildlife plant for both birds and pollinators alike. Um, gallberry, Ilex glabra. Um, this is um, a, a great bird plant. The various species of bird will eat the fruit. Um, bees pollinate the flowers. This one does like a little bit more acidic soil as well. Um, it can get scraggly if too much shade. It does make a good shrub up to about eight feet tall in medium light. The American beautyberry. This is another one it attracts various pollinators. Um, when it's blooming, it's just covered with pollinators. Um, and of course it, it's named beautyberry because it has this really attractive fruit that it, many bird species will consume. Um, the juice of the fruit is a natural mosquito repellent according to some old Florida folks. Um, that was our earliest uh, mosquito repellent. It performs best as an understory shrub up to about eight feet tall and six foot wide maximum. And medium sun to part shade is generally best. It'll look better um, than it, if it's in full sun. Wild coffee is another one that looks better if it's in the shade rather than the sun. Um, none of these are salt tolerant at all. We do have three different species of wild coffee available to us at native plant nurseries. There's the shiny leaf wild coffee, Psychotria nervosa that you see pretty often. Um, there's also a velvet leaf wild coffee, Psychotria tenifolia, um, and also the Bahama wild coffee, Psychotria ligastrifolia. Um, they all have white flowers that attract pollinators and they all have red fruit that will attract birds. They're all small to medium shrubs, um, more on the medium side, um, that prefer to have the shade, as I mentioned. They do readily self-seed themselves. Uh, scrub palmetto. This is um, a little palmetto, a little dwarf palmetto, also called sable etonia. Um, and this one is a great understory palm it, because it, it prefers shade. It only gets to about five feet tall by five feet wide. So it's a really petite little guy. Um, this is another one that prefers more acidic soil. So um, an area under pine or if, if your development in some cases um, might have been um, a pine habitat <laughs> prior to construction, um, it might be ideal for it. That's why it's important to test your soils. Um, another thing is that sometimes the native soils are, are completely altered by the building process. So um, we do test soil here at Extension. So you can certainly bring in for a very nominal fee. We can test um, soil samples for you for just a few bucks per sample. Um, and it's really a good idea to do that just so you know what you're working with, um, whether your pH is acidic or alkaline. It's really good to know when it comes to um, making your plant selection um, with native plants or any plant. Um, the sables, like or all of the sables really, attract tons of pollinators when they're blooming. Um, and the fruit is eaten by many, many different species of birds and other animals. The coral honeysuckle vine is a very well-behaved vine. Um, it does require a, a trellis or you can grow it on fences, that works too. Um, it will really become sort of a, a thick shrub-like um, thing in time, as long as it has that support. It, it attracts hummingbirds, butterflies like crazy um, that come and visit the flowers for the nectar. Um, birds, especially cardinals, will come and eat the seeds and they aid in the distribution, of course, of, of the seed in the wild. Um, it's a lovely, lovely vine. It's a well-behaved vine. It's not going to take over your whole yard the way that some vines are apt to do. The privet senna. Uh, this is a very adaptable, versatile shrub. Um, it can be a specimen plant up to about nine feet tall. It is the larval host plant for all of the different sulfur species of butterfly. 
um, it does have a gland at the base of the leaves that attracts ants that attack the butterfly caterpillars, however, so um, you'll want to watch out for that. Um, it can live in sandy soils, but it does prefer some organic content in the form of compost. Um, it's wonderful. Um, both of the um, common native senna's, um, I'll show you in the next slide, another one, the Bahama cassia. Um, cassia and senna are used interchangeably, basically. Um, um, this one is the, the Bahama cassia. They both bloom almost all year long, as long as they get enough sunlight. Um, this particular one, as long as it's in really full sun, will seldom exceed three to five feet high. It will um, kind of get stretchy if it's in the shade, and it will get up to about nine feet if it's in partial shade. But if it's in full sun, it'll stay really quite compact. Um, and like I say, blooms most of the year. And again, this is another um, larval host plant for all of the sulfur butterflies, the, the, the yellow and the pale orange um, and the, the white, sometimes white butterflies. Um, okay, needle palm. This one is a gorgeous palm rarely ever seen really. Um, they're very cold hardy. So even Northern Florida, you can have one of these um, up to zone eight. They do prefer a moist environment. So planting it near like a low spot in the yard is good or um, an area that has irrigation. It'll be nicely suited to that. It is an understory plant, so it does need shade. Um, this would grow nicely um, in an area with a lot of oak trees. Um, they do have really sharp spines. That's where it gets its name, needle palm. Um, but it is a, a really beautiful palm um, with really pretty fronds. Um, and it is a clumping palm, not a solitary palm. So it will clump out to become a, a much wider clump of palm. All right, Walter's viburnum. Um, this one is used often as either a specimen plant when it's trained into a, a single tree, or it can also be used as a hedge or a screen. Um, warning with this one, it may sucker and produce a thicket around itself. Um, if you don't want that, this may not be the plant for you, or you may want to keep it in a pot with a saucer underneath it to control that tendency. Um, it blooms prolifically in the late winter through spring. And it's another one that is just literally covered with all sorts of pollinators and birds and other wildlife will consume the fruit. Here's one of my personal favorite plants, the tea bush, also called the woolly pyramid bush, Malochia tomentosa. Um, it's a large shrub up to 10 feet wide or 10 feet tall, um, eight feet wide. Um, it can also be trained into a small tree form. Another excellent plant for uh, a diverse population of pollinators. Um, it'll be constantly visited. Um, if you're trying to avoid bees, if you have a, a bee allergy or something, this is not the plant that you want. It, it's definitely a bee magnet. Um, but if you're okay with bees, this is a wonderful plant for you. Um, it can actually uh, die if it's regularly irrigated. So this is great for non-irrigated yards um, in a high and dry kind of environment with full sun, it will thrive. Um, it blooms for most of the year with these really pretty purplish pink flowers. And it has this nice silvery green foliage um, and a really pretty reddish bark that really stands out against that silvery green foliage. It's really a nice large shrub. Um, firebush, a lot of people may be familiar with, um, is a very popular one. Um, large shrub, 12 feet high max by eight feet wide. Um, it does prefer um, a bit more moisture than, than some of the plants we've talked about um, to really thrive. Um, it prefers full sun or partial shade location rather than full shade. It'll definitely bloom more if it gets a little bit more sun. Um, it can take heat and drought, um, but a strong wind can cause some leaf browning and it can be killed back to the ground if we ever were to get a really hard freeze again. Um, but it, it's hard, root hardy to zone 9b. Um, you might wanna give this a little bit of compost occasionally to bring out um, some of its best characteristics. 
and do not allow long grasses to, uh, to invade its root zone. So keep it separated with the mulch area for sure. Uh, it attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. It does require pruning to keep it in shape. Otherwise it does tend to get a little rangy. Um, just beware, you'll see this plant for sale a lot of the time outside of native nurseries. And those are going to generally be the non-native species, um, which are mostly from Africa. All right, St. Andrew's Cross is another beautiful, it can either be used as a tallish ground cover if it's used in mass or um, a, a small shrub um, for, uh, yeah, you know, just singularly. Um, butterflies will visit it. It has nice little yellow flowers. It has kind of weepy foliage that's quite attractive as it matures. Um, it likes a slightly wetter setting, but it can definitely adapt to a drier one as well. Starry rosin is a, a typical wildflower. It will um, self-seed. Um, collecting seeds is really easy. Just remove the dead head. Um, once the, the flowers are spent and store the seeds at room temperature and plant them again in late winter, or early spring, and you'll have a new crop. This is one of the plants that is widely available on the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative that I mentioned earlier. Um, it also propagates uh, via rhizome, so you can actually do root cuttings off of this plant as well. Um, it will effectively disappear in the winter and return again in the spring and flowers can reach up to five feet high on this plant. And it is visited by many different species of butterflies and native bees. All right, um, I don't know if my, my fern person is still out there, but um, this is the one fern that we're mentioning today, Woodwardia virginica, the Virginia uh, chain fern. Um, like any fern, um, if it's happy in its spot, it's going to be aggressive and it will take over a fairly large space pretty much forever. Once you have ferns, you pretty much always will have ferns in that area. Um, so just know that going into your fern relationship. It's really good for shady spots, for wet spots, places where nothing else will grow. Um, it can make an excellent and attractive ground cover. And this can be said for most of the shorter native ferns. Um, I mentioned this one in particular because it only gets to be about two feet tall, which is pretty ideal for uh, a ground cover fern. The silk grass, Pediopsis graminifolia, is a wildflower um, like most um, perennial with a tendency to self seed itself. Uh, gets up to about two to three feet tall. The foliage is attractive, kind of a silvery gray green. Um, the foliage will spread into a small mat, which can be used as a ground cover. Um, a cut back after flowering will keep it looking neater and it does like dry sandy soils once established. Leavenworth's tick seed, Coreopsis leavenworthii, it attracts many butterflies. It is also the pollen and nectar source for honeybees, native bees, and wasps. It likes sunny and dry, whereas other species of Coreopsis might prefer a little bit more moisture. This one does not. Um, there are lots of different species of Coreopsis. Um, it will definitely reseed itself, potentially becoming weedy, depending on your levels of tolerance with such a thing. <laughs> The wild Carolina petunia, Ruellia caroliniensis. This one um, is the larval host plant of the common buckeye butterfly and also the white peacock butterfly. It also attracts many other pollinators. It is considered a short-lived perennial. You can collect the seeds, but they do need to be cold stratified. So there's a little bit of a process to it um, to ensure that they will germinate. It gets to be two to three feet tall and it can be used as a taller ground cover. Creeping sage, salvia micella. This is a wonderful ground cover for really shady areas. It's one of the relatively few Florida plants that forms a really low dense ground cover and it really needs to have shade where it will maintain this nice dark color. Um, this is actually taken at our extension office um, in the back here. Um, in the sun, it will get more yellow and pale and not be anywhere near as attractive. So it really does need that shade. 
It is the larval host plant for the fulvous hair streak butterfly. And it does have tiny blue flowers all throughout it, which are quite nice. A little bit hard to see though, they're so tiny, but they're there. Lyre leaf sage, Salvia lyrata. This um, can be mixed in with grasses or other low ground covers. Um, it, it does really reseed itself really freely. So you'll have a lot of these. Um, um, some people intermix them in their mixed species lawns um, as part of, of their lawn. And then they mow it once it's established, it can be mowed. Um, but that's only if you live in, an, uh, you know, in a situation where that sort of thing is allowed. Um, and it does attract many pollinators, including hummingbird, butterflies, and bees. Twin flower, Discaristi oblongifolia. Um, there's also a humistrata, which is the lakeside twin flower, and that one is more for wet and shady conditions, um, whereas the Discaristi oblongifolia pictured here is um, uh, much more tolerant of drier conditions. It attracts many pollinators, especially bees, and is the larval host plant for the common buckeye butterfly. Um, and it can take periods of heavy rain, but really it's great for once it's established um, for, as I said, the tolerance of really long, prolonged dry conditions. Um, once it's established really well, it can also be mowed, uh, mowed um, as part of a lawn. And last plant of the day is our beautiful little sunshine mimosa ground cover. Um, it can also be incorporated into a lawn if you're allowed to have um, uh, uh, whatever kind of lawn that you want. Um, it can be used as turf replacement, can be mowed. Um, it's not good for really heavy walking traffic. Um, you'd wanna use step stones if you were gonna be walking on it every single day. Um, and it does not tend to have good cover in late fall through early spring. Um, in some cases, it, it does become rather um, dormant and deciduous um, during the, the cold winter months. Um, but if it's used as part of a lawn, it, it can be a really pretty element um, for a mixed species lawn. It is pollinated by bees and it is the larval host plant of the little sulfur butterfly, Mimosa strigolosa. Okay, that's our last plant. Um, if you're not aware, um, the last day of April every year is Arbor Day, which is tomorrow. So if you can um, plant a native tree tomorrow to celebrate Arbor Day. Um, and if you have any questions or if you need any assistance with your landscape at all, um, my email is right here. Please feel free to reach out. Um, also, if you'd like to reach our master gardeners, you may do so at manatemg at gmail.com. And right now, um, I know Alyssa was moderating, so I don't know if we have any additional questions that Alyssa was not able to field. But um, if you have any questions right now, we can definitely do um, a Q&A. Yeah, I saved a few in the Q&A um, throughout the presentation that I think might be useful for the whole group. Um, and Great. so the first one is asking about lubber grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. And they said that they have a, a small backyard. They've got, sounds like they have a lot of native plants, but they've got a bunch of lubber grasshoppers. Are there any natural ways to deter lubber grasshoppers? Um, what should they do about them? <clears throat> Not that I know of. Um, Alyssa, do you know <laughs> of any natural ways? Um, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, no. <clears throat> and there aren't, um, there aren't really very many good, um, even insecticidal options for the lubber grasshoppers. They have a very um, effective exoskeleton, especially when they reach their adult stage, their fully adult stage. One of the best things to do with lubber grasshoppers is gonna be to go out and kind of shake them off of your plants onto like a sheet or a tarp or something you can collect them in and then dump them into a bucket of soapy water. 
Um, if you can, if you can shake them all into a spot and dump them into that bucket of soapy water, make sure they're immersed in that soapy water. That's going to be the best way to kind of get rid of the majority of them. You're never going to get rid of all of them. <laughs> I can't even get my chickens to eat them. <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried tossing them into my chickens and they just look at me like, what is this little robot you're trying to feed me? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Next question is about salt tolerance. If a plant is salt tolerant, does that mean that if they're not near salt water, they won't do well? No, not necessarily, no. Um, the only one that I really know of is the one that I really called attention to um, that specifically likes a more coastal environment, um, and that's the sea lavender. Um, that is the only one that I know of off the top of my head anyway, that, um, specifically has been tried in a, you know, several times in more inland locations and it has not done well. Um, Alyssa, do you know of any, um, besides that? Um, I, other than, you know, a mangrove tree. You're, oh you're well, gonna, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you're, <laughs> right. you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna plant a mangrove tree in an upland environment and have it do very well. It's not gonna out compete with the other things that are that are more <laughs> adapted to that location. And somebody did have a question too about um, if you can take a salt tolerant species and put it in a littoral zone in like a wetland or a stormwater pond. And the answer there is probably not. Um, only because those species that are suited to that highly salty coastal environment are not going to like that freshwater environment as well. Now, there are some species that would um, that would do okay in either place. Uh, one of them that I'm thinking of are some of the Spartina grasses might do okay if you swapped them between those two locations. But mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, really, you want to look for those plants that are that are specialized for that um, kind of freshwater wetland area. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, and then somebody has a question about um, very sandy soil that is also very shady. Are there any plants that do really well in very sandy, very shady soil? Oh, very sandy, very shady. Um, gosh. Um, very sandy, very, sh oh gosh, I'm racking my brain. Um, let's see, you know, the, the twin flower would be okay as a ground cover plant in an area like that. Um, uh, let's what see. about salvia macella? Would that do okay in the sandy or does it prefer yeah. a little bit? Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, that would too, actually. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, I don't know if they're if they're specifically looking for ground covers or or shrubs or or mm -hmm. what. Um, but um, yeah, it wasn't specific there. If if you yeah. had to, something specific in mind. Um, um you know, um um Oh my gosh, Simpson Stopper. Sorry, I had a oh, moment. Yes. Uh -huh. senior moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Simpson Stopper uh, will mm -hmm. do really well in in shade and and sandy if you're looking for a shrub or a small tree type of thing. Um, and so will um, um, fiddlewood. Fiddlewood. Mm -hmm. Fiddlewood um, would work really well as a as a small tree in an area like that as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, somebody has a question about, um, yeah, the planting in and around a pine tree. I, I can probably answer this one. The question is, should I build up the ground around the tree with soil to plant the plant? Absolutely not. You never want to um, pile up soil around the base of a tree. You never want to pile up mulch around the base of a tree. You're going to end up suffocating the soil or suffocating the tree in that instance. Um, so, you know, try to find, pick small plants, right? That can fit in between those roots, find those areas where you're not going to damage a lot of the feeder roots when you're planting um, around the tree. And then also, you know, pick things that are going to spread out around it so that you don't have to plant as many plants. So things like, like vining plants or ground covers or things like that. 
Let's see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there was a good, um, good recommendation in the chat. Somebody said that Kunti um, could be a good choice for a sandy, uh, shady location. And that, that is true. Oh yes. Good call. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yep. Um, and then uh, for folks that have more specific questions related to their um, specific soil type, like we have some things in here about um, uh, clay soil, do check out that Florida Native Plant Society website where you can kind of make some of those decisions about what your what your property is like. And then it'll it'll provide you with that list of plants, um, a really good recommendations there. All right. Yep. Okay, not seeing anything else popping up. I do really thank you, um, everybody that attended today. I know we had a little bit of issue at the beginning um, with some folks on mobile devices and not being able to see the presentations uh, or see the see the slides. So please, um, if that was a problem for you, you know, I do apologize. I, I went in and tried to make sure everything was set correctly on our end, but remember that this is an on-demand webinar, meaning that once we conclude today, give it a little bit of time, you should be able to click on that same link that you access the webinar today and access the recording of the webinar, okay? And then Susan, if you have any last thoughts, thank you everybody. Yep, and one more thing, a lot of people just like to have, um, like a PDF of the presentation afterwards so they can refer back to it. And by all means, if you'd like to email me, I can provide you with PDF of it as well. All right. all right, well, thank you. Thank you all for joining today. Happy Arbor Day tomorrow.